Hi, hey everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Canstrom. Uh, I'm on the faculty at Boston College Law School. And as faculty director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy at Boston College Law School, it's my great pleasure to personally welcome you all to this event on equity gaps in education, a timely and extremely important topic. The Rappaport Center facilitates dynamic discussions such as this on critical public policy issues. Uh, these discussions include forums, conferences, and symposia to address societal issues with leaders from government, business, academia, and the nonprofit world, and activists. To inspire future public policy leaders, the Rappaport Center also runs the Rappaport Fellows Program, which provides funded summer internships for 12 exceptional law students who are offered opportunities to experience the complexities and the rewards of public policy work and public service at the highest levels of state and local government. The center has also established the Jerome Lyle Rappaport Visiting Professor in Law and Public Policy to bring visiting professors, a diverse group of public sector luminaries to spend a semester at Boston College Law School. And finally, we invite senior fellows in residence to spend one week at BC Law School co-teaching a law and public policy seminar with me, giving a public lecture and engaging with our students and with the broader community. These senior fellows are a diverse dynamic cohort of practitioners, activists and academics who are deeply involved in timely and significant issues of law and public policy. I'm absolutely thrilled about the panel discussion that we have for you today as it fits perfectly with much of the other programming we have undertaken this year, including panels on police conduct, on evictions policies, on defunding versus reforming the police, and on equitable enforcement models of government. And before I briefly introduce our excellent moderator for today, just a couple more details. First, um, this event program with bios of the panelists is uh, available or will be soon in the chat function. Uh, as well as there may be other valuable resources provided by the panelists there. Uh, also, today's program is being recorded. So now it's my honor and privilege to introduce our moderator, my colleague and Rappaport Center Advisory Board member, Dr. Rebecca Levine Coley. Dr. Coley is Chair and Professor of Counseling, Developmental and Educational Psychology at Boston College. She received her doctorate in Developmental Psychology from the University of Michigan and undertook postdoctoral training in demography and public policy at the University of Chicago. Her research, which seeks to delineate the key family, school, and community processes which transmit economic and social inequality to children's development from infancy all the way through adolescence, has been published in dozens of leading journals and edited volumes, and has received funding from the National Institutes of Health, the Australian Research Council, and numerous private foundations. She's the editor of the new Child Evidence Briefs series published by the Society for Research in Child Development. And she holds leadership positions in the Society for Research in Child Development, the Society for Research on Adolescence, the Child Care and Early Education Policy Research Consortium and the University-Based Child and Family Policy Consortium. She has also received a Fulbright Senior Scholar Award and a Social Policy Award from the Society for Research in Adolescence. And she has been incredibly generous as a colleague and serving as an advisory board member to the Rappaport Center. So with thanks to her and to our panelists, I turn it over to your capable hands, Dr. Coley. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a lovely introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to participate in this panel. Um, educational issues and equity issues and inequity issues are really, I think, rising to the forefront of many people's minds today because of the um, just incredibly unique challenges we're facing in the education sphere due to COVID that are affecting um, a, a, just a huge swath of um, the American population and the populations in countries around the world as our educational systems are disrupted. And I just wanted to start by sort of laying the land for just a couple minutes from some of the systematic changes we've seen in the past year from the COVID pandemic that have really exacerbated some of the challenges that were already apparent in um, the American educational system. So 
we're just now really getting, um, I would guess, systematic data on some of the repercussions for learning. So a new report from curriculum associates that collected data in the fall, right when schools opened in the fall of this academic year um, across 25 states found that students were about three months behind learning in mathematics and about one and a half months behind in reading at the very beginning of the school year from schools shutting down in the spring. Um, but those averages um, shielded really gross disparities. So students of color were about three to five months behind in mathematics and white students were about one to three months behind. Um, and those are probably um, upper bound estimates because those were only assessments of children who were actually back in school. So we already, we also have data that um, a large number of students are not back in in-person learning and are struggling with remote learning opportunities. Um, so we also know that students of color, black and Hispanic students are far more likely than white students to remain in remote learning, about 70% for black and Hispanic students versus 50% for white students. Um, and data from just this past month that was just released from the Institute of Education Sciences found that only 47% of fourth graders in the country and 38% of eighth graders were in schools for which in-person learning was an option for all students in the, in the district. Um, so the interruptions to schooling are still very real. Um, and I'm very excited to hear from our um, leaders in the educational field today about some of the challenges, but also some of the successes that they're experiencing in trying to understand and tackle some of the educational equity issues. Um, so we have three experts that are working at different levels of the educational system. So first of all, Nima Avashia. Um, is an eighth grade civic teaching teacher in the Boston Public Schools. She's worked there since 2003. Um, in addition to her teaching responsibilities, she uses writing to serve as an advocate for e equity in education. She's published in venues like Cognoscenti, which is one of my favorite writings, and the Commonwealth Magazine. Secondly, we have Superintendent Maurice Edward Vincent, she is the superintendent, the relatively new superintendent of the Medford Public Schools. Um, she has been an educator and an administrator in the educational system for over two decades, primarily in the Boston Public Schools, where she started at the ground level as a substitute teacher um, and moved up to be a permanent teacher, an assistant principal, a principal, um, and an instructional superintendent, and now um, an superintendent of a quite a diverse district in Medford, um, where she will tell us about some of their initiatives. And finally, Dr. Naila Suad Nasir is president of the Spencer Foundation, which is one of the leading private foundations which funds um, educational research nationally. She previously held faculty appointments in education and African American studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, prior to that, she was on the faculty at the Stanford Graduate School of Education. Her research and scholarship focuses on racialized and cultural, the racialized and cultural nature of learning and of schooling, focusing particularly on African American students. She also is a member of the National Academy of Education and a fellow of the American Educational Research Association and is the president elect of the American Educational Research Association. So welcome to all of our guests. I'm thrilled to have you all. Um, we are going to start with each panelist having about five to seven minutes to just lay the groundwork for us and talk a little bit about their own, some of their own equity um, focused initiatives and challenges in the educational field. So we will start with Nima. And after that, I will pose some questions and we'll have a bit of a round robin discussion. And then we will open it up to questions um, from the audience. So Nima, please start us off. Sure thing. Hi everybody. Um, so as Rebecca said, I am an eighth grade civics teacher in Boston. I teach at the McCormick Middle School in Dorchester and I've been there for 18 years. Um, and I think that 
probably the thing that's been most striking for me about the conversation around equity and education during the pandemic is how much of what people are talking about now pre-existed the pandemic, which is to say, like, if I go down the list, access to technology and reliable broadband, mental health services for young people, modernized school buildings with appropriate space and ventilation, housing and food instability, funding inequity between suburban and urban schools and inequities between private and public schools. None of those things is new. None of those things has been created by the pandemic. All of those things have been exacerbated by the pandemic. What feels different in this moment is that a lot of those conversations felt like they were held largely, largely in the educational sphere. So people who were in that sphere were talking about those things and knew those things were happening, but they weren't necessarily the source of a broad conversation. Um, you weren't seeing articles in the New York Times about the mental health of students in schools um, and the lack of mental health services available. That wasn't happening prior to the pandemic, despite the fact that it has been hard to get young people mental health supports in our schools for as long as I've been a teacher. And so there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance that happens for me in this conversation where I'm like, well, yes, we've all been screaming into the void for a long time. And we're really glad that people are now seeing the issues, but it feels a little bit like, where were y'all? Like, where, where has everyone else been in our collective conversation around what it means for us to build equitable systems for all of our young people? Um, and I think about that from the classroom teacher level of even things as basic as, it took a pandemic for my school district to purchase a $19 box fan for my classroom. And they didn't purchase that box fan because it gets to be 80 or 90 degrees in June. They purchased the box fan because that was the ventilation solution that they initially came up with for our schools. Prior to this year, any fans in my classroom were mine. They're ones I bought. And the conversation about ventilation just like wasn't a conversation despite the high numbers of students with asthma and allergies in our schools. And so I think that it's just, it has been really interesting to sort of see that, to see things like two years ago in their contract negotiation, the Boston Teachers Union made a nurse in every school one of their bargaining points, right? That shouldn't, that's not what you typically think about as being part of a union's negotiations or the union's bargaining is to get a nurse in every school. But I think about where would we be right now if we didn't have a nurse in every school building in the context of this pandemic? So the, like, the sort of the depth of the inequity and kind of the level at which things have been able to go on without actually fully funding and supporting our students and our schools in the way that we need to is so profound. And it always has just felt like there's a disconnect between what's happening in school buildings and then the way we talk about it. Because every year in the city of Boston, the narrative is this is the biggest budget ever. We are spending the most money on schools that we have ever spent before without actually asking the second question of, well, how much is actually enough? What would it really take for us to do this in a way that truly and fully supported all of the young people in our schools? And that question I have yet to see anyone answer. I've never seen the like, this is what it would really cost. I hear biggest budget every year, but I never hear this is what it would really cost. And here's the gap between what we have and what we need. And here are the steps we're taking to advocate to the place to get to the place where we have what we need to really do this work. I would say that as a teacher, you know, the stories that you all are seeing about young people struggling, all of that, whether it's glitchy internet or kids having dueling responsibilities between school work and things they need to do in their home, young people struggling with eviction, with mental health crises, with losing family members, all that loss is very real. And it's coming out in so many different ways. If you think about the fact that 500,000 Americans have passed away from COVID-19, those were people's grandparents, they were their aunts and uncles, they were their family members, they were their parents. Like we have to be thinking about that very concrete experience of loss that has to be at the forefront of how we think about supporting young people as they re-enter our school buildings in whatever capacity. Um, and I think that when we start to have conversations about learning loss, I just really want us to make sure that what we put up front is actually loss, real loss, loss of people, loss of life, loss of, um, stability in young people's lives that we, we, I think, are very quickly pivoting to this question of learning loss without taking the step in the middle to say, like, wait a minute, what's the healing that needs to happen for young people? What is the collective trauma that they've experienced? What are the individual traumas they've experienced? And what do we need to build in our school systems in order to support young people with all of that before we move to, like, assessing how much they've lost and planning for academic interventions around it? I feel really alarmed by the lack of conversation around healing. It feels really concerning and it feels like it's missing the point 
which Maslow made very long ago, which is like if you're not attending the students' mental health and their well being, then learning doesn't happen in the ways that it really could if you were taking all of that into account. Um, I also just wanted to say that there are some students whose stories aren't being told as frequently um, for whom remote learning has actually worked better than in person learning did. Um, for my students who have high social anxiety, for my students who struggle with attention, for my students who have often been on the receiving end of disproportionately harsh school discipline, um, some of those young people have actually done better in the context of remote learning because we've taken away the sources of anxiety, we've taken away the sources of distraction, we have taken away the negative authoritative interactions that they were having in school buildings. And so I really hope that we think about as we plan for education, like what does it, what does it look like to make sure that all of those young people continue to have ways of accessing learning that work for them? Because those were sometimes young people who in-person learning didn't work for and didn't work for in the ways that it should. And so we can't just sort of be like, well, we did this and now we're going back to this and not acknowledge that for some young people, this really worked better. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I just think as, as we're sort of like thinking forward, um, some of the things that we've really been thinking about at the school level or what, and that we'd really like, I think, to see support for is what does it look like to build schools and systems that really center relationships, really prioritize the relationships between young people and between adults and young people, which means thinking about things like making smaller class sizes. It means increasing the number of guidance counselors and social workers in schools. It means trying to make things just smaller and more connected. How do we pivot to deeper learning models instead of a seven period high school day of 45 or 50 minutes? What does it look like to say we're not going to do as many things at once? We're going to slow down. We're going to have fewer classes. They're going to be longer. They're going to be in sort of focused on deeper learning. And then related to that, what does that mean about what our conversations around standards and assessment need to look like? Um, do we need to really shift how we're thinking about those questions of standards and assessment to reflect sort of a shift in school culture and a shift in our priorities in school. Um, because if we're prioritizing like connection and depth, then like pages and pages of standards and very rigid standardized assessments are not necessarily the model that is going to sort of like be able to hold and support young people in this moment. Excellent, thank you, Nima. Really provocative ideas that we will pick up on um, in our discussion, fantastic. Maurice, we would love to hear from you. Yes, um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Naima, for sharing as well. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about when I got to Medford in 2018 as superintendent of schools. Um, equity, um, when we think about the topic of today's discussion, equity gaps in education, what do you do with it now? I was faced with a challenge when I came and it happened to be a middle school challenge. Here in Medford, um, we have two middle schools that are um, fed into by four respective elementary schools that are located within different parts of the city. And so um, this brief slide deck talks about um, the two middle schools and the, the inequities that I observed when I first came. And so what was observed when I first came was that between these two schools, um, which are essentially located upon the same campus, you had one school, and if we just look at the colors, um, that had um, greater, uh, greater percentage of students of color and um, English learners and versus the McGlynn Middle School which was at the time prior to doing this lottery was 46% white and the remaining percentage was all of the other um, racial groups. And um, next slide, please. The Andrews Middle School, which was our second middle school was 73.6% white. And so when I went to the two schools, it didn't seem like I was in the same exact district. Um, I also want to share with you, not only was there a difference between the two schools in terms of racial breakdown, but also in terms of socioeconomic status. So at the McGlynn School, um, we had approximately 61, 62% of our students receiving free and or reduced lunch and 39.6% paid for their full lunch. 
And at the Andrews School, we had 70.9, 71% of our students were paying for lunch. And so the balance, approximately 28 percentage points um, were either free or reduced. So there was definitely um, an equity gap and there was also a gap in outcomes in terms of how the schools were performing. So what did we do as a district to solve the disparity? We implemented a lottery system um, where students and families would no longer choose which school they chose to attend, but would be randomly assigned through a middle school lottery. Students who were English learners would auto automatically be assigned to the program for um, English learners at the McGlynn and students with certain special education needs they would be automatically assigned to that corresponding um, school that offered their program. So when we implemented this middle school lottery, the question was, did it work? And the response was, yes, it did work. Um, we implemented this lottery and we said, what would happen if we use this random gen generator? And I just wanna quickly show you what ended up happening once the lottery was implemented. So the racial breakdown at the McGlynn school changed. So originally it was 46% white and after the lottery, it became 57.2% white and the other um, racial groups are still listed there. Um, they, there was a shift and can we show the Andrews School as well. When we did the lottery a second time, there was a shift. And so the numbers ended up changing from 73.6 originally to 54.9%. So this was through a random lottery trying to ba better balance and level the schools off. So not only did this happen from a racial breakdown, but let's look and see what happened um, at our attempt to get um, greater consistency from a socioeconomic status perspective as well. And so the McGlynn School, um, which originally, uh, when we looked at their free and reduced lunch, they were around 61% um, free and reduced with 39%, 39.6% paying. And the Andrews School Again, this was the 70.9% that were paying. Um, once the lottery happened, we saw a significant shift in the SES. The McGlynn School shifted and became 48.4%, uh, which were paid, and the remaining 51 and change percent um, were free and reduced. And if we look at the Andrews School, where it originally was 70.9%, it shifted and became 55.4% that were paying and the balance were free and reduced. And so it ended up uh, not being perfectly balanced, but in an attempt to try to bring about equity in a capacity that I could bring about greater equity, um, that was what we ended up doing and for a district, it did make a change. It, it, bal it better balanced the schools and brought about more, um, I would say, harmony between the two buildings. Thank you. Great, thank you, Maurice. That was an excellent um, model of working on equity issues. And again, that we will follow up with questions. Um, Naila, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, that was really, um really interesting so far to hear about the kind of range of issues and, and how you all are working on them. Um, so my work is really twofold. One, as a scholar of race and education myself, and more particularly as a learning scientist who thinks a lot about the nature of learning and the conditions that support robust learning. Um, and two, as the president of the Spencer Foundation, which funds education research nationally, where I have a chance to really see what's on the hearts and minds of researchers of education across the country. So. As I think about equity issues in education and how they've been exacerbated by COVID-19, a few kind of thoughts come to mind. Um, one, I've been struck by 
this notion that the COVID-19 health crisis is co-occurring co -occurring with what others have recognized as three other pandemics, right? The pandemic of systemic racism and historically rooted systems of privilege and denial of access. Two, an economic crisis, right? The high levels of unemployment and underemployment and increasing realization that our approach to economics in this country and an economy in this country is actually unsustainable. <laughs> and three, a climate crisis with again, an increasing realization that our ways of being and doing are not sustainable for the planet. And so on all of these dimensions, change is necessary. One might argue drastic change is necessary. And it has been a time of, of drastic change in education. Um, and I think that, you know, we, I, I, when, when, when schools went remote, I thought, wow, we are seeing more change to systems of education in the last 30 days than we've seen in the last hundred years. Like, mm -hmm. wow, change is possible. And in all the ways we've said, well, we could do that, but we really can't. Well, systems can't pivot that quickly. Well, we, we can't, like that entire narrative to my mind has been blown apart because we can. We have seen that what we need is the will and, um, and the kind of collective wherewithal to make the changes that we think are important to make, right? We made a bunch of changes in the interest of the health and safety of, of teachers and students and, and, we, and we, could, we, could, we could do more. <laughs> um, so for me, that that's mean, means a couple of things. One, we've seen some change, much more change and different kinds of change are necessary to realize the full possibility of our education systems as core to our democracy in this country. I was so excited, Nima, that you're a civics teacher and I wanna hear more about how you're thinking about civics in this really important moment at the intersection of these pandemics. Um, it also means that I feel like as a collective, we are realizing that marginalization and inequality don't serve anyone well. I mean, you know, we, we saw, um, we've, we've seen this in, in very public displays um, in our country in the last few months. Um, so that indeed these systems of inequality don't even serve the privileged and they're detrimental for our entire society. The extreme levels of racial and social inequality in our country have created whole swaths of people without the basic means to make a living, to be educated, and who across racial lines are disaffected and unable to realize the American dream for themselves and their families. And this has created a context for frightening levels of domestic terrorism and disinvestment. And it doesn't have to be that way, right? Alternatively, we could use this moment to pivot towards developing models and systems that move towards equity and that support human thriving. And so I feel like there's an opportunity and a danger as we come to this point where school reopening and summer learning are on the horizon. And I think the opportunity is that we're coming to realize that now more than ever, learning involves young people, but also that families have a really important place in young people's learning. That, you know, the, the points that, that Nima made around funding matters, right? And it's and in some ways, it's implied in the work that, that you talked about as well, um, Maurice, that when you, part of the reason to, um, to, to integrate schools is so that you can increase resources all around. So you're not having a way to have these, these incredible resource gaps. So funding matters. And we saw that wealthier districts in this pandemic had greater flexibility to meet students' needs than high poverty districts across a range of kinds of needs, right? Whether that be access to, to technology, whether that be access to teachers, whether that be teachers who were trained to do this new online version of teaching, a whole range of things. We saw that schools can be both sites of learning and meeting students and families' basic needs for food, for internet service. We saw schools distributing meals to communities. Like this is a different model for what it means to do and be sites of education. We saw that learning for students can be self-directed and that, but that it requires being emotionally whole and supported. Learning is best when anchored by a sense of human connection, belonging, and community. And we saw our young people suffer when those things were not in place. And that learning is far richer than simply conveying content. Because if it were, if it were only about conveying content, we wouldn't see these massive drop-offs in grades and engagement that we're seeing when the content is moved online, right? This is about is, is human relationships and connection. The danger is that we go back to what we've always done. 
The opportunity is that we lean into what we now understand to create systems that work better for young people and for families. And I think there are some, some good things we've seen too. Like we've seen an incredible level of investment in education by the federal government. Like this $1.9 trillion, like this is unprecedented in terms of the amount of, of resources that are gonna go to K-12 and, and higher ed institutions. So can we galvanize to ensure that these funds are spent effectively towards learning? Can we utilize them to broaden how we educate young people? how we engage families as true partners in the process. Can we lean into new kinds of funding formulas, reconfigured multi-age classrooms, experiential learning in ways that support both deeper learning and holistic thriving. And finally, I, I, I think that we, and I hope and I pray that we as a society come out of this pandemic with a much deeper respect for and value for the work of teachers. How do we ensure that teachers are honored as professionals who have expertise that we need, that need to be able to make a living and support their own families and who deserve to be able to buy houses proximal to the schools and the neighborhoods in which they teach? How do we finally really attend to these pending teacher shortages in the wake of waves of retirements that are coming nationally? And how do we attend to diversifying the teaching force in ways that mirror these cha the changing student demographics that we know are present and, and continue to be on the horizon? So I feel both a sense of trepidation and a sense of excitement. Like this is a moment to really reinvest in education as a society and take our equity goals as a nation um, really, really seriously. Excellent, thank you, that was inspiring. So I would like to follow up on some of these issues, a, a really a very broad range of issues were raised. I think I would like to start by asking you, each of you to expand a little bit on what are some of the bright spots you see? What are some examples? So Maurice, you gave us one example of a successful equity initiative um, you know, at a, at a district level of, um, for a specific age group for middle schools of, of implementing um, a random assignment lottery to make the distribution to schools more equitable. What are some other examples of successful equity initiatives um, that we've seen and that perhaps even the challenges of COVID have opened up because of, you know, just how much things have shifted so I think with um, what was being presented earlier and Nima made some uh, mention, right now during the pandemic, this COVID era, some of the uh, one thing we've done, we've been able to do this year with the influx of federal monies is we were able to become a one-to-one -one district this year in particular. It is about leveling the playing fields and so um, one of the comments about um, when the pandemic took place, we prioritized our most vulnerable students. They came into school first um, back in September. So th those were our um, students with, with um, special needs, our English learners, our homeless students, our foster students, early childhood students, prioritizing them um, for those families that are in need or most marginalized, some of them that needed connectivity we did um, as a district invest in connectivity for those who could be homeless or moving in between homes. So those were some of the uh, more recent ways that as a district, we've been truly trying to meet the needs of all of our learners. Um, we do use an equity lens in what we do. My core values were um, achievement, collaboration and equity when I came into Medford. And then when the pandemic arose, we prioritized safety, consistency, and equity. So to be able to do it um, evenly or as fairly as possible to all schools. Mm -hmm. So it is true from um, providing food for those who, who need additional food to providing hotspots to um, becoming a one-to-one -one district. So Fine. could you could you explain that term, Maurice, for those who aren't familiar with it? What does a one-to-one -one district mean? So um, all students within the uh, Medford Public Schools have access to uh, electronic device, a computer, a Chromebook. We purchased um, Chromebooks for all of our students. Um, some of our students use um, iPads. And for select students who may be in um, 
you know, difficult situation right now, we also purchased the hotspots. So mm -hmm. some people live in areas or maybe their, their home has like a dead spot or a dead zone or they, they could be homeless. And um, that was something that was needed. So it was one thing to get a device into their hands but if we put a device in your hands and you don't have internet to make it work, then right. you know what's the point of the device? Right. So we 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 made a commitment to take it that you know extra step to be able to say not only will we get you the device, but for those who truly have the need, um, we would make sure that you could also have connectivity, the internet so, access. Yeah. The so I I think that's a perfect example of of how we've made some progress. So many states and districts in the past few years have had programs where they gave universal, they gave all seventh graders iPads mm -hmm. um, or Chromebooks, um, and many of those initiatives were much less successful than people hoped, just because of those issues that they gave them the the computers, but didn't think about the internet access itself. Um, and that was not something that was equitably available to all students. Um, so it sounds like the other thing you mentioned was really focusing on the highest needs students and identifying those that are most in needs of in most in need of supports and that that was an effective strategy. Nima, do you have another any other examples? I mean, I think as a classroom teacher, the thing that I've done the, that has had the biggest impact this year is to really make space for just listening to young people. Um, a, a, a friend of mine likes to say um, there's only one generation of students who know what it's like to be in school and do remote learning during a pandemic, and that's the young people who are in schools right now. And no, no matter what our intentions are as adults, like ultimately, like we are not the people who are doing this. Like I'm teaching it. I'm not the learner, right? And so the biggest shift that I've made is to really intentionally create space on a regular basis for young people to both let me know how they're doing and also to let me know how I'm doing and what I need to change and what I need to shift in my practice in order to better support them. Um, and that shouldn't be a radical thing, but I actually think it is radical in the context of our education system where so often the people who are most affected are the least listened to, and that's students and families. Um, our entire system is designed without really fully engaging the people who are most impacted. And I think that the biggest shift that we could make and the most important shift we could make is to upend that paradigm and to really start with young people and their families and to say to them, like, what do you need school to do for you? And how do we build school so that it does for you what you need it to do? Um, and I think if we did that, schools would be radically different places than they are right now. But if you take that kind of perspective, how do you deal with a vast array of, of disparate individual needs? So if you ask that question to everyone in your class, you will get 25 different answers. I'm not sure you'd get 25 different answers. You might get like eight or 10. Okay. I would say like people fall into buckets, right? And like mm -hmm. right now, what we have done with our education system is it is largely one size fits all. It's kind of like, it has been like, this is the way and everyone has to do it this way. And if it doesn't work for you, by and large, what happens is bluntly, the students who it doesn't work for end up leaving. Um, they either end up getting pushed out of our school, our school system by the school to prison pipeline, or they end up leaving by other means. But the reality of the situation is the, the one size fits all hasn't ever worked for all young people. So I think, yeah, we might end up with a very, we, we might need to think a lot more flexibly about what school is and what it means and how it works but that flexibility would actually allow for a broader set of young people to be supported by the system, as opposed to the system that we currently have, where in a given year, like we're excited if the graduation rate is 71%, but what about the other 29% of students? Like, where did they go? What's happening to them? What are their outcomes, right? Like, I'm not sure that we can say, well, like I think saying we can't accommodate the needs of a broad set of people effectively means we exclude a significant amount of people. And I think often the people we are excluding are the most vulnerable people because our systems haven't been built or centered around the needs of vulnerable folks. We don't design, like human-centered design is not a thing that we are doing in education right now. It should be, but we're not, which means that like generally our systems are not designed to support the most vulnerable. And so those are the folks who are ending up excluded by the way we currently do things. So I think it is gonna require flexing in a different way. Um, but I don't think it's optional. Like, I think we, we have to figure out how to do it. And I think, as you mentioned in your introductory comments, there's growing evidence that some students and indeed some adults, some workers are actually 
happier working at home online, um, that for their psychological situation or physical situation, interpersonal situation, it's actually a more comfortable learning environment and potentially a more productive learning environment. And I think that that um, beyond homeschooling and unschooling has not been something that we've taken seriously in, in prior iterations of thinking about our education service, servicing all children, serving all children. Um, Naila, what would you say to this question? What are some um, examples you've seen of successful initiatives, particularly that target um, equity issues? Yeah, I mean, I think there have just been so, so many across the country. Like I've been just incredibly inspired to talk to educators and superintendents that are centering the needs of families and young people that are rethinking what it means to do and, and organize school and, and want desperately to think about what kind of alternative models there could be. There are folks doing really amazing work on summer learning and, and creating experiences for young people this summer that are about grounding them in relationship and connection, providing rich academic and intellectual content while doing so. I mean, so I think there's a, there's a lot that's exciting that's happening across the country. Um, if I think about kind of overarching things, I would say um, the pausing of standardized assessments and tests, both K-12 and higher ed has been huge, partly because, you know, the tail, it, it, the assessment is the tail that wags the dog, right? Like it's the thing that defines how we organize instruction, how we prioritize what, what it's important to teach. And so with higher ed, we've seen, you know, I mean, I know this, we're focused primarily on K-12, but the idea of pausing ACT and SAT means that college admissions is going to look completely different. And I mm -hmm. would, would bet that the incoming classes this coming year will be more diverse because of it. K-12, in, in similarly, the pausing of assessments we, we, means we have to really think about what really matters. Like we have been for a very long time in education measuring what it's easiest to measure rather than what it's most important to know. And I think there's an opportunity to kind of lean into that. How do we measure what it's most important to know rather than just, you know, what's easiest? I always think about that as like that metaphor of the person looking for their keys under the lamppost and somebody says, is this where you lost your keys? No, no, I lost them over there, but it's lighter over here. Like it's, it's, it's our, our system of assessing the things that we don't even think are the most important things and then using that to drive instruction is really counter to producing spaces that are um, conducive learning environments. And the assumption that everyone should learn the same thing in the same way on the same pace that also underlies the kind of standardized approach to, approach to assumption is also deeply problematic. So all of that to say, I think I've heard in over the course of this year, many new kinds of conversations around how we think differently about assessment moving forward and whether that be in, you know, in, in folks who fund education. So education philanthropy is having an entirely new kind of equity oriented conversation that I've, that I've not, not seen, um, as well as kind of folks who are doing the real work on the ground in schools are also, I think, um, thinking in more expansive ways about how we organize teaching and learning for, for young people. So that actually really leads in nicely to another question I had, which was, are we able to systematically track what we think is important right now? Both learning, but also students' um, socio-emotional well-being, relational well-being. Do we have the systems to track those key issues? And if not, what would it take? What sorts of data do we need? What sorts of tracking systems do we need to be able to understand how students are doing, um, particularly if, if we have the opportunity to get away from these really narrow standardized assessment systems? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, <laughs> we, we, do not have the, we do not have the tools that we would need to, um, to measure such things. Um, However, we have tracked young people, you know, <laughs> in ways that we probably, I, I was <laughs> tracking might not be the word I would use. Um, we, we've, we've tracked young people to, to death. Um, and so I guess I would think about, I would think about this a little differently on, because if you're a parent or you're a teacher and you're in a space with a young person 
and you're in relationship with them and you're talking with them or you're a school nurse or a counselor and you're again you're in relationship with young people and families you know when kids are struggling you know when folks are suffering and and so the the question isn't could we know mm-hmm. right or or maybe even do we need a massive kind of assessment system to know the question for me is how how do we have systems in place that trust teachers and counselors and families as the source of really important information? And then how do we have systems of support in place so when they notice something's not okay, that they can you know, help provide resources for young people? And how do we have classrooms that aren't alienating to begin with? Right, like you talked about disproportionate discipline. You know, I, I have a little pet peeve around when we talk about social emotional learning, we're talking about skill sets that young people bring. And we need to be talking about environments that, <laughs> that classrooms provide, right? Like it's, it's reasonable to be disaffected if your classroom environment is hostile to your being. And so I think that we, we just need to step back a little and broaden around how we think about what assessment is to see it as something local, to see teachers as professionals, to, to have you know increased um, other kinds of support personnel in schools that can really um, attend to young people's needs and create a, a much richer kind of network of resources. Uh, I'd like to add to that if possible. I just, um, Please. Jesse Hagopian is a teacher He's a Jesse Hagobian is a teacher in Seattle. He also writes for Rethinking Schools. And recently I read a metaphor that he wrote where he said, you know, if someone fell into the Arctic, when you pulled them out, you wouldn't stick a thermometer in their mouth to measure their temperature. You would wrap them in blankets, you would put them by a fire, you would give them something warm to drink, you would make sure that they were okay. And then somewhere down the road, when they were no longer freezing from being in the Arctic, you would check in to see what their temperature was at that point. I think that that metaphor feels very apt for this moment. Like, I really think that we should be thinking about how we take every resource we have available to us and put it into direct support for young people. I think the measuring can happen later, but I think if we are talking about measuring in this moment, but we haven't, like, I have yet to hear about additional mental health services being offered to my students. So if you want to do a survey of my students' mental health, which is going to cost money, but you're not actually going to provide me additional mental health providers, Mm -hmm. what's it for? And who's it for? Because at the end of the day, that's not for my kids. That's for somebody to be able to say something about my kids. But objectively, you haven't actually increased the amount of supports in schools for young people. So what are you measuring? Um, I just I think we, we need to slow down and make sure that we're putting the money where it's going to have the greatest impact, which is which is in service of young people. Mm-hmm. So Maurice, it seems like you've had some experience with these issues and trying to target resources towards those with greatest need. So how do you determine that? <laughs> how do you determine those with greatest need or how do you determine how to direct resources? So I would say one of the um, sources of information we get, believe it or not, are the classroom teachers who also fill us in on um, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, if little Johnny seems to be, you know, hungrier, if it's something about food, that they may pick up on that first, and then they let us know, and then we will come in the background, whether it's the administrators, the principal, the school nurse, we will find a way to get those additional supports. Also, for students that are struggling social emotionally, um, the teacher can sometimes, is, is usually the first person who will pick up on that. Sometimes we're fortunate enough to have parents that are, you know, well informed to call directly to say my child needs additional supports. What can you offer them? What can you give them? We have guidance counselors, adjustment counselors, school psychologists, but we are aware that we're definitely going to need to do things differently. Um, I really like the visual image, Nima, that you shared with us of the Arctic and like uh, realizing that you're not going to be focusing on taking someone's temperature when you know that they're freezing. Um, So we are actively thinking about that, trying to think about summer programming, meeting the needs of our kids, um, social emotionally, um, conducting observations. Um, We have student support teams like SST type meetings where if there's someone who kinds of pops up on the radar, 
to say, let's get some extra eyes um, in to observe or look to see how can we start thinking about interventions. So there are a lot of things that are um, happening and with the transition, um, having uh, more students uh, in school um, for longer periods of time, because we have been in school in a hybrid capacity for mm -hmm. the majority of the year, but being able to look at those students that are there. And then even for our students that have been fully remote, um, families notifying us or teachers observing um, that certain students are not as engaged, maybe always keeping their camera off, you know, never unmuting themselves, that we try to follow up and reach out to, um, reach out to the parents to see if we could get them you know, some counseling, whether it's through the school or through outside agencies, depending on the family's preference. So we are trying to find ways to take assessments um, on our students and um, get the supports in real time. But we, we do rely heavily on the teachers to be able to let us know what they are observing when they're teaching. Mm -hmm. their so it sounds like a lot of really, and, and Naila, as you had mentioned, really sort of on the ground, localized, inclusive responses are required um, that are drawing information from, from students, from parents, from teachers on up through the system. How, I'm interested in your thoughts of how, how can successes in that way, how can systems that are built that succeed at that ground level be shared though? Because if we have all of these districts or schools or classrooms um, developing successful models, succeeding in reaching students and building relationships with students, how do we transfer that success and that knowledge to other teachers who are less adept, to other systems who have leadership that isn't prioritizing these relational issues. How do we help to share that information? Yeah, um, I think that's an important question. I, I do think one of the really interesting components of this time is that I think there's been more collective action than I've seen in the past, more sharing of information at multiple kinds of levels. I will say that I'm not sure the problem is the places where good things are happening isn't sharing it with the places where not good things are happening. I think the problem is that our systems are actually set up so that people who want to do good things that prioritize young people and families have a very hard time doing it within the kind of policy context. And so I might reframe your question a bit to say, how do we create the macro structures that facilitate this great work? that people are now kind of having to undertake heroic measures mm -hmm. <laughs> to try to make happen. I mean, to Maurice's point about like at the, at the district level, needing to create systems that reconfigure towards integrated school environments because our whole system is set up and in that, you know, our levels of segregation across the education system are greater than they were in 1954 when Brown versus Edu Board of Education <laughs> happened, right? Like we, so, the systems themselves are set up in ways that prevent this great work from happening. And so I think the question is, what are the systems we need to create more space for this really important work? And how do we think about guidance to districts, to teachers, you know, professional development? How do we think about the, the pipelines into teaching? How do we think about these systemic components that bring us to the kind of work that Nima is able to do in her classroom because probably she has to ignore some of the things coming from the top in order to do that, like prioritizing and centering young people. Like you got to throw out the curriculum to say like, how are you all today? Like what's on your minds? And so how do we have a curriculum that doesn't require itself to be thrown out to do great work with, with students? Excellent. Do you have some other examples of that, Nima? I mean, I, I did. I threw out my whole curriculum this year. Um, <laughs> The, the, I mean, the civic standards from the state are 15 pages long. To teach in a remote context, it would literally mean teaching a different topic every single day. I didn't think that it was going to work as a mechanism for engaging people in remote learning. So I took the themes and I found literature that connects to those themes. And my civics class this year is we're reading. We read Enrique's Journey, which is about immigration. 
we're reading Just Mercy and we're going to read Stamped by Jason Reynolds and Ibram Kendi. And like, I would argue that's a pretty damn good civics class because it's going to really get you to engage with like some of the most complex issues that we have going on in our society right now. Immigration, criminal justice, and race and racism, right? None of that is in the state standards. Not a lick of it. I'm supposed to teach the Mayflower Compact. I'm not doing it. Because like as, as a person who cares about young people, who knows the moment that we're in, I feel like I have a responsibility to help them be able to have the language and the bodies of knowledge to engage with this moment. But that meant making a moral choice that I feel like I shouldn't actually have to make. Like, why do we have sets of standards that are so divorced from kids lived experiences and from the experiences of what's happening in the world? Like, how do we end up with standards that are so disconnected from our lived realities, right? Like, the, the conditions, I think, Naila's point is dead on. The conditions aren't currently set to do the kind of meaningful work that people want to do. If people are doing it, they're doing it in opposition to systems a lot of the time, not in collaboration with systems, because the systems aren't set for that. The systems are set to maintain a status quo. And, and if you're trying to disrupt that, it means you just have to kind of be like, well, someone can come and yell at me, I guess, but I, I feel like I, I feel comfortable in the choice that I made because I think it was the right thing to do. And I think kids would say the same thing. So that's, that's my moral barometer is, if young people and families feel right about this and I feel right about this, that's where we're gonna live. Um, because we all have to live with this. Like we all have to live in this moment and have to grapple with all of the pandemics that are happening and try to make meaning of them and try to go forward, right? So I, I, think, I think that it should, I wish that it wasn't like that. I wish that we had the ability um, to create a system that was more responsive and was more rooted. Again, I think if we flip the paradigms around who was dictating who school was for and what school was for and what it was supposed to do, I don't think there would be this disconnect between what comes down and what people in buildings and in schools actually need. But I think that disconnect is really profound in this moment. And, it, and, it's, and, and that disconnect is, is there across content areas and over time historically. So one of, one of my former doctoral students, um, Jarvis Gibbons just wrote a book where he's documenting kind of educational practice of Black teachers historically and, and specifically the role of Carter G. Woodson, but he talks about what he calls fugitive educational practice, like fugitive teaching, where teachers would teach what they knew young people needed. And then when, when the district you know, would come in to monitor them, they'd have a book out of which they never read before to the end. So, and these fugitive educational practices, I think, are, are happening in lots of places. I, I wrote a book with a group of amazing, amazing math teachers from a district in California that had spent 20 years together creating an equity pedagogy for mathematics. Over that 20 years, they had created a pedagogy and an instructional system that basically dismantled um, any type of differentials by race and gender from ninth grade to 12th grade. So by 12th grade, they had incredible numbers of young people taking calculus. They had virtually no disparities by race or gender in levels of achievement or levels of learning. And, and that school and that equity pedagogy no longer exists in that form because of a district mandate about using textbooks and, and, and an overriding of a block schedule to a schedule that you know, was, was you know, seven or eight classes a day, like that, that district priorities and standardization made it such that this group of very committed teachers who've been working together to create this place for a really long time could no longer do their work. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's just a, another example of how the systems we set up work in opposition to equity goals. And I always like to say, like, we, we know what good instruction looks like. We are just only willing to provide it to some children. And, and, and that's, I think, a fundamental <laughs> um, commitment that we, have to, that we have to reconcile. Are we committed to providing mm -hmm. instruction that's, that engages people as whole, that provides opportunities for critical thinking, that is centered in emotional health and connection. Like, are we committed to doing that for all children? Or are we committed to doing that only for those who can pay for it either with their tax base or with private schools? <coughs> but, but we know what it looks like. This is not a mystery. 
So uh, first of all, I would like to encourage the audience to add your questions. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I will start moving into those questions. Um, I wanted to press on that a little bit because I think we've we've had decades and years of sort of more localized control of schools or state level control of schools that has led to a lot of inequities in educational outcomes across regions of the United States and states in the United States. Um, so how do you try to fight against that level, those types of inequities um, with states and districts that tend to have the most students from low income backgrounds and students of color um, suffering and often having less support for innovation um, and strong leadership. I, I think- I mean, I can- just, Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Nima. No, I can only speak to Boston, but I would just say like in Boston, we don't have local control. We have an appointed school committee. And if you look at urban districts around the country, that is actually more and more the case that the, the districts that have the highest percentages of students of color and the highest percentage of low income students do not have local control. They are not democratic bodies and they are not um, being given the power to make decisions that are in their best interest or in the interest of the people in the community. It is being dictated by people outside of them. So I'm just not sure that, that what you're saying lines up with what we're seeing in urban districts. In Boston. Okay. And we and, and not just in Boston, across right. across the country. Mm -hmm. so, so, so to have you know local control without adequate funding, it's, it's a non-starter, right? So you have to start with: Are we investing in education? Are we funding schools and districts so that what happens locally is conversations around what's best for this community, but that there are the resources to adequately educate young people. And that's, I think, a conversation we haven't really been having. We haven't really been having nationally, though, again, this American Recovery Act is one sign that perhaps this federal government takes, you know, funding to education very seriously. But we've been underfunding schools in this country for about at least three decades. And during those three decades, we've seen kind of national levels of, um, of learning by most measure by, by, by most measures decline precipitously. And when you look at countries who fund education well, who take teacher training seriously, you see the, the levels of, of achievement and learning increase as well. So mm -hmm. I think you're right in that it's a, it's a fallacy to say, we're gonna let everybody come up with your own solution and oh, there's no money to do so. That's not adequate. And you do need an adequate central, you, know, you need a federal government that sets the conditions so that states and localities have the resources to mm -hmm. do the things that are right mm -hmm. um, in, their, in their community. Although I think a lot of the research suggests that funding levels are not strongly predictive of outcomes for students in schools. No, There's some conflicting evidence more recently with changes in funding levels have been successful in, in raising achievement levels. Um, but I think- Well, if also, you measure achievement levels by standardized tests, and you and graduation and you, rates and graduation rates. So you mm -hmm. so these are very gross measures mm -hmm. of, of achievement, and not at all. It, it's very unaspirational to aspire just to those things. A and you don't attend to what the money was being spent on. Right. I mean, there was a whole rash of these studies in mm -hmm. the about the mid two thousands and and some more currently that funding doesn't matter. No one believes that. That doesn't even stand to reason. Of course, funding matters. Because if you don't have the funding to create the resources, then you cannot educate people. So I think it's a, that, to my mind, those studies have been a little bit, there's been a political layer on that that seeks, that, that seeks to make a point that doesn't stand to the test of common sense. Mm -hmm. so right. Perhaps right. after and a certain threshold, like, sure. But mm -hmm. yeah. Right, but it's about- I also just think like- on. Well, I also just think we, I mean, if we, if we thought that funding didn't matter, look at what's happened during the pandemic. Like the reason why schools and urban districts by and large aren't able to fully open is because the buildings and the infrastructure are not in place for it to happen. We don't have MERV 13 filters. We don't have mechanical HVAC. We are functioning on like, we have schools that windows don't even open, right? So, and then, and then it's like, why well, can't, the schools in Boston open compared to the schools in Swampscott. And it's like, well, 
look at the buildings, like have a real conversation about the ways in which funding inequity has created vastly different situations in these districts. Like, and that is, again, absent from the conversation. Like people don't want to talk about it, but that is all about funding. So to act, I mean, it just seems like the argument gets debunked by this moment, because in this moment, the level of access that young people in suburban, di suburban districts can get is completely tied to the amount of funding that has been able to go to those schools. Right. So Maurice, so you, I presume, make a lot of the decisions about how to divvy up the funding in your district. How, what do you have to say to these issues? So just listening to the issues um, where Nima was just talking about the HVAC, um, that was a challenge we had at the start of the school year as well. Um, we have um, six newer buildings and then we had two that were older. And so we had to get retrofitted the, the HEPA filters and we had to prioritize that. So that was the first thing that we did. And we also purchased external filters because you're, you're not gonna be able to um, get all of that done in the course of the year. So we ended up, due to the influx of um, COVID funding from federal funding, we, we invested heavily in um, a couple of hundred HEPA filters for the older buildings to be able to have access to. And then we repaired. Um, so that was a significant investment. That was where the money went first mm -hmm. to get the buildings online so that we could um, safely have our teachers and students enter the buildings. And then, you know, with the influx of money, we did, we purchased, um, spent over a half million dollars in um, buying MacBooks, uh, computers for teachers, and um, getting adapters and document cameras, which we just wore external mics. Um, we made investments so that they could better meet the needs of their um, students and be able to teach better with Mm -hmm. you know, uh, more quality equipment as opposed to Chromebooks. So that was something that we didn't have here. And I know having been in Boston, um, the teachers already had computers there, but in other places, sometimes that wasn't the case or mm -hmm. people had their own technology. So I do feel like um, you have to put your money where your mouth is. You have to look at what what is a challenge that's right in front of you and address that challenge right away. And so with safety, consistency, and equity, we prioritized everyone's safety. And once we got everyone into the buildings, we were testing our staff um, starting in September through um, Tufts University and Ford Institute. Right. We were COVID testing in September um, for oh. all of our staff who wanted it. And then- Right, our, so all of those initiatives cost a lot of money. So it seems like one thing that's happened with COVID is both the influx of money from the COVID Recovery Act and from, from earlier influxes from the federal government, but it also sounds like potentially there's been more local control over funding during COVID, that schools have been able or districts have been able to identify their own particular needs regarding whether it's technology or the physical plant of the building or um, supporting other needs of students such as, as food needs, et cetera. I, I wanna say that with some of the monies, depending whether it was the ESSER monies, depending which funding it was. Some of them did not allow you to actually purchase FTEs by other staff. So mm -hmm. we purchased a lot of PPE and masks and shields and all of those things. So there were some uh, specifications. So there were limitations for how some of the money could be used. So it really did take you know the team to sit down, the leadership team, working with the school committee, um, you know, working with our health officials, our board of health, to really figure out what could we do, getting medical feedback so that we could open safely and get mm -hmm. people into the building. So th th right. th there definitely um, were a lot of decisions that had to be made, but with that influx of federal funding, it did make a difference for how we could function as a district and really get out there um, to meet the needs of everyone. A year ago, pre-COVID, if you had said, were we a one-to-one -one district? The answer was no, no, we were not. We didn't have the funding for that. Right. Um, did we have hot spots for students? No, we did not. And yet, you know, that was a plus that we were able to make it work to our advantage in the capacity that we could. So there, there has been this influx of funding. I think the question is whether it will continue and whether it will help to build systems that will be able to carry forward. So we, we have a question from the audience that I would like to pose. This is a bit of a shift in direction. 
Um, it asks, when in an equitable society do we recognize differences in talent and skills to be able to shape educational programs to respond to those differences in talent, I suspect? Yeah, I mean, differences in talent and skills are a given in any group of people, in any, collect, in, in any collective, right? Um, Lonnie Guineer talks about the fact that um, the, it's, not the, it's not the problem that people bring different talent to the table. But the problem is that we, um, uh, the problem is that opportunity is unequally distributed, right? Talent is equally distributed, opportunity is not. And so I think that we absolutely should aspire to a school system where if you're, if you're an, a young person who's an artist, you have a place that's gonna really support that artistic talent. If you're a young person who really thrives on math and science, that you have the possibility of an environment that really meets that need for your hunger to learn math and science. That if you're a, if you're an introvert, maybe you can have a couple of days hybrid. Like, yes, we should have systems that meet individual needs. Um, but I, I think that we also have to be mindful that sometimes things that are systemically created masquerade as individual difference. And sometimes in the name of individual difference, we have diagnosed and tracked young people so that opportunity is reduced and not expanded. So I just think there's a, something to be very um, careful about there and, 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 and attentive to the ways that that's played out historically. I think as a classroom teacher, I also would just say like, that's my job. Like my job is to build a classroom context where like a range of a range of interests, a range of skills, a range of talents can be held. And where like in the context of a given lesson, like kids can find different ways to tap into that space. They can find different ways to sort of like explore. They can find different ways to express their ideas. Like that's what good education is. I think sometimes because um, it is easier to segregate than it is to build classroom environments that can hold that diversity. We have created systems where there's some perception that like a certain set of talents needs to be held in a certain kind of school. And I would really push back against that and say, I think it's all of our jobs as educators to build educational contexts where a range of young people can thrive and can really feel like their needs are met in that space and they are enriched in that space. Um, I feel like we run the risk when, when sort of the message is like, young people of X set of talents need to go to Y school. Um, very often what that looks like on the ground is we have deeply segregated schools. So I would push for us to be more flexible in how we think about what our schools hold rather than um, creating specific environments for whatever we perceive as a certain set of skills. Mm -hmm. So evidence clearly shows that schools are becoming more economically segregated that, that in the past 20 years, um, neighborhoods have become far more economically segregated and schools in turn have become far more economically segregated. What as, as members of the educational system, what can we do about that? Sure. Are there ways to fight against? So Maurice, you had an excellent example within a particular district, a sort of moderate sized district, I guess I would say for Medford of, um, kind of enforcing equity and lowering economic and racial segregation quite dramatically in just, in just one year, <laughs> right? Um, so what are, some other, what are some other ways that we can address, that we can sort of try to counteract those rising levels of segregation? So this particular question, as I think about it, I think um, when you're thinking about neighborhood schools, you end up with that dreaded word sometimes um, of busing. And that also creates another problem if you're saying, if you live in the North, you're gonna go to school in the South. If you live in the East, I'm gonna send mm -hmm. you to the West. And so I, I think what's most important is to try to make all schools great schools. And to Nima's point, um, you know, having spent a long time in Boston, there are schools that are specialized. We have like an arts academy, you have STEM academies, you know, where, where kids are dancing and, but there also is the flip side that you're not able to replicate all of those programs in every single building. But um, I, I would just say, as you're trying to level the, 
the, the playing field for all of the students. Um, I, I feel like as superintendent, your goal is to make all schools great schools so that no matter what part of the city you live in, you have access to a desirable school with um, many learning creative opportunities to tap into, you know, whether it's the arts, whether it's science, whether it's music, whether, um, you know, it's technology. I feel like we need to raise the level, we need to raise the bar, no matter where you're located, so that you have options. Because sometimes it doesn't make sense to say, well, you live in the north side of town, I want you to go to school on the south side of town. And then mm -hmm. the, the poor child has to spend, you know, 40 minutes um, going all the way across okay. town for what point or for right. what? Yeah, I would, I would add the, the root of this, the root of this problem is residential segregation. Right. And, I, <laughs> and, and you know, there've been some really beautifully written books in recent years, Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, mm -hmm. Heather McGee's new book, The Sum of Us, which document the history of racial residential segregation. And the point I always like to make about this is it didn't happen accidentally. Right? Racial segregation was policed by policy, by federal policy, by state policy, by the practice of bank, the banking industry and real estate agents. And when people try to create integrated communities, there, there are many examples over historical time where people have tried intentionally to create integrated communities and were, were, were punished by these policies and laws. So, all of that to say for me is you can't talk about segregation without acknowledging that it was intentionally built and maintained mm -hmm. by public systems. And if that's true, then the, 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 the solution here might not be about something that happens within school buildings. So I, I agree with you entirely, Maurice, but the solution is actually about what would be the policy to create integrated, mm -hmm. equally resourced communities. And if we could create these, these really deeply segregated communities, we could create different kinds of communities with the right intention and public policy. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, do you think that it's possible that this is one area where COVID um, might have some positive downstream effects? Um, so, for example, we have a lot of very wealthy people moving out of urban and suburban areas into more rural areas that are typically um, less high income, lower income, lower resourced. Um, we have a lot of movement of people into different communities from the pandemic. I think it's possible, but I think, you know, we, we're in this I wish I, you know, this graph about um, income inequality, which the, the, the rise in income inequality is a very steep curve. It is. And I think I read something recently that the top, something ridiculous, like the top five billionaires and multi-billionaires in the country have the amount of wealth equal to the whole bottom 40%. Like the levels of income inequality in this country are astronomical. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if without intentional policy change, that trend is going to be reversed. Um, and, and, you know, for yes. me, that would be policies around the, you know, increasing the minimum wage, attending to working mm -hmm. conditions, access to pensions and retirement. Like there's a whole set of things you would do if you were. And wealth redistribution, which are, which are all in the docket of potential um, bills being pushed onto Congress by the current president. So we shall see if we have movement in those arenas in the coming months, it's possible. So changing tax a little bit, um, another um, member of the audience asked, this goes back to, I think, some of the things you were talking about, Nima, about um, emotional support to students and listening. What specific structural changes could help us listen to students more and support teachers who are currently being told to prioritize testing or state standards? So how can we try to um, support that in an institutional level, those practices? I mean, I think part of it is about scale. You know, I was talking to a teacher um, who is in, in a district in Texas where she had 187 students. She taught 
Um, like just, I mean, at that scale, like you can't, um, you're not going to be able to know your students well, and you're not gonna be able to engage in meaningful and deep ways when you have 45 students per class and classes are 45 minutes long. Like a lot of how we have built our school systems actually works in opposition to relationship building. And when people are building relationships, they are doing it like in the hallway or by having kids with them at lunch or by keeping kids after school or by coaching a sport. Like our, the way we've built school doesn't actually um, nurture relationships. It's like people find ways to nurture relationships, even in the context of structures and systems that make it really hard to do it, like we were talking about earlier. So I think like, you know, people don't want to talk about things like making classes smaller because that costs more money, but like smaller class sizes would actually help with this. Shifting teacher student ratios would shift this. Having advisory structures in every school where like a part of every student's day was a socio emotional check in with someone would make a difference in this. Um, I think shifting again, Joe made this work around deeper learning, like shifting to models where you have fewer classes at a time and you really dig deeper into that content as opposed to this weird seven period day that somebody along the way decided was a good idea and now we just keep repeating and repeating. Like that's a shift that would make a really big difference. In order for that shift to happen, something has to change around standardized testing because you might not have math all year long. You might have math for a semester and you might have it for a really long time when you had it and really get deep into it. But to give you a test in June about a class that ended in December or January isn't really reasonable. So things would have to shift in terms of both like how we schedule, how we staff, how we structure and how we assess if we were really trying to kind of shift paradigms right. here. So certainly some schools, maybe they're more charter schools or, or building systems like that, really changing um, the scheduling system. Naila, do you know of evidence of the success of those efforts on a systematic level? I just know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, block, block schedules are, are not uncommon. Um, and I think, I don't know if I know of any specific studies on the, the, the kind of isolated effect of block scheduling. Um, but I do know that, you know, in, in the districts that, um, in, the, in that district that I studied, the math teachers um, that I worked with were really um, clear about how important it was to have um, a class period long enough where young people could take up intellectually rich, complex mathematical problems collaboratively in ways that they felt was fundamental to the to their pedagogy and to support deep mathematical learning. So, and I think that there has been research on structures like advisory periods and, and other kinds of things that do make a difference around young people's sense of connection, engagement, belonging, and mm -hmm. learning. And we know from the learning science that um, that where people don't feel like they belong, they can't learn. Like where people don't feel connected to other humans, they cannot learn. It's neurological. <laughs> And so attending to these things is really, really important. So going along those lines, thinking about another question we had was um, thinking about some of these populations that often have felt more disconnected in schools. So the question is, how have English language learners and students with disabilities been impacted by COVID? Um, and what can we do to address equity gaps specifically around these populations? I, I was going to say, I think it's critically important to have translation available and reaching out to parents on um, a consistent basis. Um, I know here we have teachers um, talking points. It's like an app where um, they can send messages to parents and it can translate and um, parents are very responsive. Um, you have to be flexible um, if you're communicating only in English and you're expecting them to understand it's it's not gonna work. Um, in Medford, we send things home in four languages um, all the time. We have translation available and um, we rely heavily on our English learner teachers to, um, if there are very important messages that are going out and we're sending it out, we ask that they also just go that, take that extra step and make sure that the parents realize this is an important message and mm -hmm. make sure that whether it's through translation or say, look out for this particular communication, this is what it is. So we try to do that. And for our students with disabilities, we have a very, very active CPAC and our students with um, our special needs teachers, our special education teachers 
they are also equally very communicative with our parents and making sure that we get the message to them. It's going that extra mile to ensure that they're not being left behind. And so it may require a little extra work, but the willingness to do that, to make sure that they get the important mm -hmm. messages. Great, anything to add? Nima or Naila, I think we have about two more minutes. Um, just to say, yeah, that the both critically important issues. I mean, thinking about the the ways in which students with disabilities have been incredibly underserved by this move to virtual schooling is a, is a very serious thing for us mm -hmm. to be thinking about. That are the same for um, students who for whom um, English is not their first language and where they are learners of English. And so, I think in some ways, to Nima's point earlier, that when you when you have a system that teaches to the mean and that focuses on standardization, it's harder to adapt for many of these more um, less well-served or more vulnerable student populations. If you have a system that's set up that, that to meet the needs of individual learners and to connect with, with individual learners on, at, at, their, at their pace in their way towards their best outcome, your, that system is is more likely to be able to meet the needs, but no, we're in a it, it's a <laughs> that there is I would say a, a buddy crisis around the ways in which students with disabilities and families with students with disabilities have been incredibly underserved during this pandemic. So you know, great to hear Maurice that you're that you're really leaning in on those things. And I would just say I think for the for parents um, and in particular thinking about Boston, uh, a significant number of our um, ELL students are Latino. Um, thinking about the ways in which we provide direct aid and support just seems really, really, really crucial in this time. Um, my Latino families have experienced probably the most housing transition of any community at our school. Um, folks, folks, COVID has impacted Latinx families in the city at a very high rate. Like, there's just a way in which I think we need to really be thinking about how we hold and support um, kids and families. Uh, more closely, I think, than we have in previous times, particularly because we often just sort of teach to this like general mm -hmm. or build the system around this sort of general student profile. We haven't been doing the like specific targeted support that we need to do to really acknowledge where families are at, how they're being affected, and like what it's going to take to make people feel whole kind of as they re-enter um, post-pandemic life. Do we have time for one final question? Or are we are you coming in, Dan, to say the thank yous? I think I should probably say the thank yous because we'll lose people at five thirty when the yes. when the, the when the afternoon bell rings, school is out. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank the Lynch School for co-sponsoring this event. Thank you, Rebecca, for fantastic moderating. Thank our panelists. What a rich and incredibly provocative discussion. I really think we should have booked 12 hours for this. I just found myself wishing I had had any of you as a teacher for myself or for my own children. I, I just so inspired by this discussion, although I am stuck on the relationship between that polar metaphor and climate change. I'm still trying to figure out how we navigate the, those two problems, but that's a longer term conversation. But thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. I'm sure our students learned a lot in it, and I'm sure all participants really benefited from this. You've been very generous with your time and with your thoughts. Thank you all. Yes, thank you so much, really. Thank you. <laughs>